As part of its 50th anniversary range of collectibles, Corgi brings to life the characters from Tales of Midnight from highly acclaimed creator Francis Lee. Beautifully sculpted in resin and superbly crafted in metal, these limited edition figures are a must for any collector. Available now from selected retailers. When you think of comics, what comes to mind? Superman? Spider-Man? The X-Men? Well, the world of comic books is finally changing. Desi DNA presents an exclusive insight into the major players who are turning their fantasy into reality. Be prepared to be propelled into the Super League of comic strips and graphic novels. Welcome to the world of Asian superheroes, hijab crusaders, and all things spandex. Francis Lee is the mastermind behind the comic sensation Tales of Midnight. For me, comics were always about um, uh, being storyboards for the little director inside your head. So you'd see a panel, and your imagination would kick in, and it would just transport you to a whole other world. They were my friends when I was growing up. And uh, to this day, I feel that comics, uh, or rather sequential art, whether it's a comic or a graphic novel, is still that same portal to transport you away to another world if you've had a bad day at school, or a bad day at work, or a row with your wife, or a row with your husband, whatever it is. And for me, that, that was really the motivation for me wanting to have Tales of Midnight. Hi, I'm Walter Koenig. While you're here, don't forget to check out the fabulous Tales of Midnight comic book. Dave, just prior to being on set with the first Star Wars movie for the screen test, what were you actually doing? Well, I never had a screen test, actually. I never had a screen test at all. Now, George Lucas came over in the, in the Christmas of 1975. And I, or at least I got a call from my agent in the Christmas of 1975 saying that George Lucas was coming over at the beginning of 1976 and wanted to see me. And uh, so in, in January of 1976, um, I got a call from Peter Beale, who was then the managing director of 20th Century Fox, who was quite a good friend, actually, because I'd worked for several times for 20th Century. And um, he called me up and said, look, you know, I'd like, like you to come up and meet this guy called George Lucas who wants to see you um, about a film he's doing later in the year. And so off I trotted up to the 20th Century Fox offices and I met up with Peter and Peter eventually took me in to see, meet George and I'm confronted with George who to me looks like a, a very young student and with his beard and hair all over the place and, and you know, check, check shirt, like, you know. And, um, and he, said, he turned around to me and said, well, he said, I'm doing this film called Star Wars, which is like a space fantasy movie. And he said, I'd like to offer you one of two parts in the movie. I thought, wow, this is, this is, this is great, you know, being offered one of two parts in a movie, like, you know, without having to do anything. So I said, so the, my immediate question, I said, well, you know, how, excuse me, I said, you live in Los Angeles, and I've, I've always worked in England. I said, how did you know of me? And he said, oh, he said, I saw you in Clockwork Orange. If you're good enough for Stanley Kubrick, you're good enough for me, like, you know. And so I, so I said, well, what are the two parts? And he said, well, the first part's a character called Chewbacca. And I said, well, what in the hell is Chewbacca? And he says, like a hairy gorilla that goes through the film on the side of the goodies. And I thought, oh, God, no, I don't want to, I don't want to do any more mask parts. I really got to the stage where I thought I'd done enough mask parts. I'd, I'd all played all these Frankensteins and monsters and creatures and things like this. And I thought I'd done enough of this. And I thought, well, I'd like to get away from doing this and let people see who I really am, you know. And uh, so I said, no, I don't fancy that, George. I said, you can keep that. And so I, I said, what's the other one? He said, well, the other one is the big villain of the film, a character called Darth Vader. And I said, well, don't say any more, George. I'll have the villain's part. Thank you very much. And he said, well, tell me for why. Why did you pick the villain? And I said, well, if you think back on all the movies that you've ever seen, where there were goodies and baddies, I said, you always remember the baddie. I said, if you think back on all the James Bond movies, for instance, I said, you remember people like <coughs> Odd Job, you remember Goldfinger, you remember um, Dr. No, you remember all these terrible villains. I said, but you tell me who played James Bond in the movie. And he said, Dave, he said, I think you've made a very wise decision. He said, because nobody will ever forget Darth Vader. And here we are, 23 years later, traveling around the world on the back of Darth Vader, and Darth Vader has now become accepted as the ultimate screen villain of all time. And, uh, and also, I just got voted into the second most recognizable icon um, in, in, in sort of history. Um, I think it came second to Mickey Mouse, actually, <laughs> which, is, which is quite a good accolade once again to have, you know. So, um, you know, I'm very pleased. I mean, I, I, I took the script away, obviously, and had a read, and, and, and you know, by the time uh, I'd read the script through and then turned up at the theatrical costumiers, which is Berman's. Um, I'd already realized what a great part this Darth Vader thing was. And then, of course, I go and see the costume, and there's this big black mask and helmet. I thought, oh, here we go again, like, you know, so. But that was how it all happened. Oh, 
Hi, I'm Tony Self. I'm the director of the short documentary that you'll be seeing, uh, which basically chronicles a typical day in the life of Francis Lee, the creator of Tales of Midnight. Uh, basically, on this day, we followed uh, Francis as we changed Vanessa, a normal model by day, into Sarah, the heroine of Tales of Midnight, um, through the works of body paint and uh, Photoshop manipulation by the uh, excellent artist Duncan Gutteridge. Um, you'll be able to see how the transformation process went, so I hope you enjoy the show. So Fran, where, where are you taking us tonight, or uh, today even? Well, today we're off to Stanford La Hope, to a place called Inspirus Photography, where um, illustrator Duncan Gutteridge is going to be body painting Vanessa Upton, a cooperative when it comes to, to modelling, and uh, Duncan's used her in the past as, as a model for inspiration for his uh, illustrations. And he tells me that uh, he thinks he can transform her from Vanessa Upton, ordinary human being, to Sarah, super partner of uh, our favourite hero, Midnight. So, we'll see. Excellent stuff. Hi, my name's Vanessa. <laughs> and my name's Sarah. Uh, Sarah, 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 Sarah,
to tell the story about these characters and tell something. Um, and I self-published the comic to begin with myself in the shop, and it sold out, which was great. But I knew that even though it sold out on a relatively limited run, it wasn't enough to really um, make a distribution company like Diamond get behind it and keep behind it month after month. So I decided the best thing to do was to try and create an awareness and a demand for it outside of the comic industry through a licensing campaign to try and get companies interested in the characters, um, either through their imagery or through the story, uh, and ask companies if they've been producing products to create brand awareness for the characters and the property ahead of the comic book being published through the comic industry. We've got um, these fantastic things. These are desktop calendars. You can peel the character off and put it on your exercise book, your lunchbox, collectible sketchbooks, limited edition prints, trading cards, greeting cards, and of course the uh, superhero angst-ridden tales of characters trying to find love or fighting off bullies until some freak accident gives them a superpower or ability. Comic strip aficionado Francis Lee has had a very similar journey with his comic book phenomenon Tales of Midnight. Born in India but raised in the UK, Francis Lee was forever getting into fights with skinheads in the 1970s. After learning martial arts to defend himself, a keen comic reader from day one Francis went a step further and totally geeked out and opened up his own comic book shop. So how do you come from being a fan to then actually getting your own comic book out? OK, well, I guess uh, for me it, it, was, it, was, it was luck more than anything else. I, I've been a fan all my life and as a fan I had a collection of comics which just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it got to the point where there were literally thousands of comics and they were filling lots and lots of boxes in my home. So it was either a question of getting a bigger place or um, opening a comic shop. And that went well for, for several years. And then what happened was at that particular time, it, it seemed as if the industry seemed to be moving more towards um, collector's items and special editions and, you know, flashy covers rather than worrying too much about the story and the content. And being a fan myself, I was also, you know, disappointed that we weren't getting the kind of stories that I wanted to read. Comics, to me, were, were a doorway to step into a world that, that allowed me to, 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 um, to enter this, this, this world of heroes and romance. I'm on my way. And so Francis created and self-published his comic, Tales of Midnight, which follows the adventures of two crime fighters, Midnight and Sarah, who complete with utility belts and gadgets in sexy blue spandex, take on whoever stands in their way. At the time, it made, it made a big impact on me. For example, with my character Midnight, he'll never kill. End of story. No way. The, the, there's no motivation. But he's a lawbreaker, though. By night. He fights for justice, and justice in his eyes is not necessarily the laws made by man. I've got to say something about Sarah, though. She's damn sexy. She's I very mean, sexy. I mean, you, you've, you have not sort of uh, been shy, have you, in, in her figure and so if, if you had any idea how parts. many people have asked me to reduce the size of her boobs, it's. Um, <laughs> but no, she's all woman. Has, has, she, has she had a bit of uh, work done? No, absolutely not. <laughs> she's just, just good, clean living and healthy exercise and. Uh, well, I'm now fancying a comic character. Isn't it interesting? It is interesting. Isn't it interesting? Find him! Just one chance. They took her, but I planted the transmitter. Then we still have a chance. I can patch into the city cameras. We can track her through those. I've 
tracked them here to Pier 37, switching to lens cameras. Looks like they're loading the shipment now. Okay, the good news is that there is a way into the building without you having to go through the guards. The bad news is, it's underwater. Okay, switching to sonar mode. I'm going in. I'm not sure for how much longer. The shielding from the piping is interfering with transmission. Midnight? Midnight! more challenge for you as an actor? I don't think there's any question that Bester was a more challenging role. It, you know, life has a funny way uh, of uh, evolving and developing. Um, it really, it's really nice that it came to me, that this, this character, rather late in the game. Uh, I might not have appreciated it as much had I been offered this kind of um, experience, you know, back when I was in my 30s. Um, I mean, you know, if, 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 if the opportunity was there to reverse the order in which I played these two characters, uh, I would much prefer the way it, it's, it's worked out, the way it's transpired. Bester is indeed a dimensional character, always challenging. Uh, how to integrate all the different aspects, the somewhat contradic contradictory elements, and make them part of a, of a, of a whole. Uh, to the extent that I succeeded, and I suppose that's open to conjecture, but to the extent that I feel that I succeeded, um, I feel very rewarded by having uh, had this opportunity. Chekhov, I will always have a, uh, you know, a, uh, I will ha have a great debt uh, to. I mean, it, it's kept me going for 30 years in one manifestation or another. Uh, I have an affection for the character and a great sense of camaraderie for the folks with whom I work. And of course, the they su supported the fans for all these years. So there is that. But if you're talking specifically about the aesthetics of a role and the artistic challenge, if I can be so presumptuous as to talk about tele television and artistic challenge, then certainly Bester 
and the uh, the machine gun fire that's uh, going on outside um, is is the character that I've had the most fun with. As Chekhov, uh, you were one of the supporting characters to Kirk, McCoy, and Spock. Do you feel that it was very much the Star Trek philosophy to keep secondary characters very much in a supporting role, or do you feel that they could ever take center stage in a Star Trek story? Well, they did in Next Generation. They did in Deep Space Nine. It's just that the, the way things were done in the 60s was you would have two or three stars and you'd have supporting players. That's the way it was done. The great irony about Star Trek is even though we've always been about the future, we were really bogged down in the past when it came to the features because we never got past that. We were always the supporting characters. We're still in that 60s mentality of the three, the three stars and the four talking furniture, you know, to one degree or another. Uh, but, the, uh, but that was, I think, that was really not uh, as a consequence of Gene Roddenberry's vision of how it should be as much as it was a, uh, as much was a reflection of the times. That's generally the way things went. Walter, you've expressed an interest in potentially playing a character in Tales of Midnight, the animated series. What would be different for you in playing an animated role? I've done a little, I've done a little voiceover animation work, so uh, I, I've had some experience with it. Um, I don't know. I think you try to make it as you try to you know make it as rich as possible. Try to to make the character, the vo the vocal qualities as as um, as dimensional as possible. You don't have the advantage of the you know the physical expression and the behavior. So I think you it's not that you overact, but that you're cognizant of how much you need to be able to uh, bring to the vocal performance. As part of its 50th anniversary range of collectibles, Corgi brings to life the characters from Tales of Midnight from highly acclaimed creator Francis Lee. Beautifully sculpted in resin and superbly crafted in metal, these limited edition figures are a must for any collector. Available now from selected retailers.
I had heard about Next Generation for a year before it was cast. I tried to get in for a reading, couldn't do it. Uh, I was told by my agents and manager that, sorry, you know, it's already cast, and, um, but maybe in the future there'll be a part or something like that, you know, like guest star. And then about two weeks later, they called. They said, looking for the part of a Klingon. And I, I mean, I was a fan of the old uh, original show, so I knew what a Klingon was. And so it was, it was easy for me to go in there and, and, uh, and do that. But that's, that's how I heard about it. Did you have expectations of how they would expect you to play Wolf? And if so, did they differ from how you eventually did play Wolf? Um, good question. The, the, what happened was that, um, well, two things. I, I knew how the Klingons were from the movie the movies that had come out at that point. I guess there was maybe two or three movies that had been that had come out uh, at that point. Um, but as an actor, the first thing I asked the producer or whoever, I said, look, what do you want from this character? You know, what do you want to see? You know, how do you see him? And Gene said, you have a blank slate. Do what you want to. And I said, okay. And that's how it happened. That's how it worked. It began. Were there any absolute don'ts, though, for no. the character? Mm -mm. Wow. He said blank slate, which is, which is the brilliance about, about Gene, because most producers will not do that. Um, but he knew that if you give an actor a blank slate, they're really going to take it personal. They really are going to work at it and make something out of it. And then that way they know who this, this character is. So you don't have to tell them, oh, you know, Worf wouldn't do that or da-da-da. He knows, you know, the character, and, that's, and there's a certain amount of pride that this is your character. The development of Worf as a character from the beginning to the final scenes, he stayed pretty much constant. Yes. This mm -hmm. was a code he followed. Mm -hmm. How would you best describe his code? Well, the, uh, it, it's, it's a two-part answer there. The first, thing, the first part is I, I always thought of, thought of him as, um, as a samurai, is the code that we're talking about, the Bushido, I think that's what it is. Okay. And um, in fact, we started out him being kind of wild, and every time he gets into a fight, you know, he'd be uh, screaming and, you know, and hitting people wildly. And about the third or fourth time that we did that, um, I went to the producers and I said, look, you know, I really want to change something because I feel that this guy would be more in control, so I want to add something to it. And Dan Curry, who was a special effects supervisor on our show, is also, also a martial arts expert. And so he and I got together and we started making moves and doing, you know, the Klingon martial arts is, is, is our um, uh, creation. And that's how that started. Um, the other thing was that I told him I, I never wanted Worf to change. I said, once he mellowed, you've lost him as a character. You've lost who he is. You know, all of a sudden he'll just be a, a teddy bear. You know, oh, oh, Worf, you big, dumb, stupid guy, you know. And uh, I never wanted to, um, that to happen. I never wanted to pull his teeth. I really wanted him to stay the same. And we, they pretty much, they tried over the years. They tried very hard, you know. Warp smiles broadly. You know, I, I said, Warp doesn't smile gratuitously. He, he smiles when there's a reason to smile. The part of Greedo was relatively short-lived on screen. Should have been in it huge amounts more. Actually, I did film quite a lot, which wasn't in the, uh, the original film. That was the next question. I mean, how long... Uh, in terms of shooting, were you actually on set to provide oh, that? Uh... I think I was there a fortnight at the most, in, but only in the cantina sequence. And then I remember doing other sequences um, with an actor called Declan Mulholland, who's now sadly died, uh, who played the original Jabba the Hutt as a, as a human. Uh, and it, I was, the character I played, I was supposed to be his sidekick, his, uh, his assassin. And um, I remember doing several sequences underneath the mock-up of the Millennium Falcon, <laughs> uh, playing with a toy ray gun, shooting Harrison Ford, going pew, pew, <laughs> for about a morning. So that was quite fun. So there were lots of sequences that I remember doing that obviously didn't get in the, uh, the original. But that's the same for all movies. You, you record so much footage that seems like a good idea at the time, and then 
when the producer or the director sits around and looks at the rushes and thinks that's good, that's good, they've obviously got to edit down. So uh, the, the, the buzz was that there was about eight hours worth of material from the original one, um, which was cut right down. So uh, obviously a lot of that's got to go. And, uh, but I was only in the cantina sequence for about two weeks. That, that's all I was doing. But it was two weeks of hell because it was so hot. Do you feel that you were able to bring anything of you through the mask and through the character? Yes. <laughs> absolutely nothing. No, that, absolutely nothing whatsoever. I was lucky to, to stand, really. I thought George Lucas's advice of played like they do in the movies, kid, was the best advice to anybody, really. Because, I mean, the sequence I did was Western, pure Western, really. It was the gunslinger coming into town being threatened by a baddie, that's all. And, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I mean, as any actor would like to think that he brings something of a, of a uniqueness to anything. Um, I'd like to think that. I know it I probably didn't, because when you're in a green mask, it could be anybody in that green mask, really. And in fact, the way they treated the voice. Yes, I mean, I think, again, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and probably the fans will, but um, I think my voice was the only voice that was electronically scrambled, so it is my voice. Whereas most of the other characters, apart from Tony and um, Sir Alec Guinness, uh, and there were one or two others, because most of the cast were English, of course, apart from Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher in the original Star Wars. And uh, all the English cast were dubbed into American, understandably so, because it was seen as a global market I in those days. And uh, the English voice probably wouldn't have worked as well. But I think it was my voice, but sort of through an electronic scrambler.